G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. 17th of April, getting ready for the Outsiders. Hopefully first dog will be there as well, but I don't know about that. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. Thanks, Barry. Time now for Outsiders indeed. Joining you today are Jane Gilmore, writer and feminist, Jason Thought, professor of economics, RMIT, also adjunct fellow at the IPA, and Santila Chingaipe, journalist and producer at SBS World News. Well, it does seem as if Brownwood Bishop's career in federal parliament will soon be over, as yesterday she lost the pre-selection battle in her seat at McKellar to liberal staffer Jason Felinski. In case you're unsure as to why the former speaker was challenged and rolled yesterday, here's a little reminder. And when I saw the figure as it was published, it was clearly an error of judgment. And that large sum clearly unacceptable, and that's why I repaid it. But you say it's an error of judgment. Can yeah. you apologise to the Australian people who are watching you now? Well, I think the biggest apology one can make is to repay the money. That's Brownwin Bishop at a press conference she gave following revelations she'd spent $5,000 of taxpayers' money on chartering a helicopter from Melbourne to Geelong. Jason, should Brownwin Bishop even have stood in this pre-selection? Was this not the moment for her to have already gone gently into the good night? Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that. I mean, there's, um, she's been there for a while, and there's, some, there's, um, there's always some fantastic talent coming through um, in, in these other elections. Um, there's plenty of people to take over her, her liberal um, worry your role in this. So we've seen um, Tim Wilson and James Patterson come through in this. So I think overall this is a good thing. Well, okay. Jane, like, what's your take on it? 22 years in politics, it's kind of an ignominy attempt. Um, it is, but the thing that I found really interesting listening to all the commentary about it is everybody's been talking about the personal vendettas and the factional warriors and all the different alliances. I haven't heard any commentary from anybody about who of the candidates was actually going to be a great parliamentarian or a fabulous legislator or a really good representative for the seat of McKellar? It's like that would be just laughably naive to talk about politics in that way. And I think that's really sad for all of us. I think in a battle like that, no matter who wins, everyone loses. So until the Liberal pre-selection for McKellar was won by moderate Jason Felinski. And with party members rejecting Conservative candidate Walter Villatoro, does that say more about how the Liberal Party is now choosing to place itself in lead up to the election? Is this just a move away from the right more towards the centre, do you think? I don't know. I can say uh, specifically, but I do know that this guy was uh, backed by Malcolm Turnbull, um, and whereas the other guy, who I think was um, was endorsed by Tony Abbott, which again was seen to be rather interesting, considering that he was quite close with Brian Bishop, but obviously because of her vote um, during the leadership spill to back Turnbull. Um, it came back to bite her in the backside. But I think with McKellar, because it's always been, you know, a fairly safe liberal seat, um, I think there were concerns that had uh, Bronwyn Bishop gone to the next election um, in that seat, perhaps um, the liberals um, may have not um, gotten the result they would have expected. And, and I, I, I think it was it was written on the walls. I mean, you know, she, it, it had a, hasn't been a very um, good couple of months for Bronwyn Bishop. And Jason, are they playing it safe, do you think? Or just, was this just one of those things where it was bound to happen regardless. Look, I think it was going to happen inevitably. Um, yeah. All right, we're moving on from politics. This is Tammy Shaw. You're listening to Sunday Extra right here on RN. My outside guests this morning are Jane Gilmore, Santila Chingaipe, and Jason Potts. Let's move now to the Senate, which reconvenes next week. The Greens have announced that their first order of business will be to introduce a royal commission into the banking sector. I'm confident that the Senate can actually send a powerful message to the government that, uh, you know, we do need a Royal Commission into financial misconduct. That was Green Senator Peter Wish Wilson confirming his intentions of introducing the motion this coming week. Jason, what are the priorities for the Senate this week, do you think? Um, look, I, I don't think a, a Royal Commission is, is a priority in this sense. Um, this just looks like political theatre at the moment. Um, in the sense, what is the Senate without political theatre, though, right? <laughs> well, I mean, ideally, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> Will will the ABCC and the and then the trucky bills overshadow this then? Um, no, I mean those are important issues, and I think they're they're ones that that go to the heart of microeconomic reform. Um, they don't sort of have the sort of populist image that, that I think that um, I would like to see, but they're incredibly important issues that need to be um, introduced, and I, this is a, a legitimate trigger. 
Yeah. And the, with the Royal Commission, that's been one of the things that into banking, for example, that's been one of the things that people are talking about. Some people are saying it would be a waste of taxpayer money to do it. Others are saying that if you don't do it, then that's also a waste of taxpayer. Which one is a bigger waste of taxpayer money at this point? Well, they're both equally a waste and not a waste. We know that there's a problem in the banking system. And the reason that people start calling for royal commissions is not because there's no problems. It's because there's endemic problems. And that seems to be the only way we can fix it. I think it's also disingenuous for people like Scott Morrison to be saying, oh, we don't need a royal commission because ASIC's still there, despite the fact that they've taken most of their funding away. And I find it bizarre that he says things like that and appears to think that the voters are so stupid they'll believe it. He doesn't have, seem to give the voters any credibility at all for being able to see through what he's doing, which is essentially protecting his mates. And we know that's what it is. Right. Do you think, Santana, that the, um, J well, we're hearing rumours July 2nd, there's a, a bit of a snafu apparently with some signboards being delivered to the wrong person, all of a sudden it's become a news story. Is July 2nd a legitimate thing? Will that affect how Senate votes and acts and behaves now for the rest of the few weeks? Quite possibly. I mean, you know, um, obviously the um, ABCC bill is the election trigger bill. Um, and I was reading something that apparently, you know, the government is looking to add an extra amendment to that to ensure that the crossbenchers actually, you know, vote against the ABCC bill. Um, but at the same time, I also, I also think there's the introduction of another bill this week, um, the Truckee, the remuneration tribunal, and, you know, abolishing that. And I think that that's going to be the priority for a lot of the crossbenchers because I don't think that they necessarily trust the government in in terms of ensuring that they um, get their say with that. So I think that's probably going to be the first priority for the crossbenchers is to get that um, tribunal remuneration bill through and then get to the ABCC. Jason? Yeah, I mean, that's another one that is, that is um, strikingly, that is particularly important. And it's a direct attack on small businesses um, that is abs an absolute abomination. And um, I think this this should be a priority to try and um, well, remove that. that. But that's the thing, it should be a priority. They just won't really become yeah. a priority. But what, what's been interesting, particularly with abolishing this um, tribunal, is that no one's actually talked about what's going to replace it, because at its core, it's supposed to be this um, safety watchdog of, you know, truck drivers on the road. And it's all sort of turned into this sort of political um, kind of, um, you know, situation where, you know, there's been less um, dealt with, you know, the actual figures about, you know, road safety and people actually dying on the road because of um, these owner truck drivers um, and that sort of situation. So that's going to be quite interesting to see how that's addressed. But I think it's typical of the way the Turnbull government's dealing with everything because it's all underpinned by this attitude that rich people are rich because they deserve to be and everybody else just is too lazy to try hard enough and therefore the only response is punitive. And I think that's reflected in almost every policy they have. But at the same time, with the elections coming up so soon, and I, I just feel, is, is there not that concern of right now, make no sudden moves, you might get noticed, it might affect voting in, well, in July 2nd. Wouldn't this be the time to play it safe, for example? Well, I don't think playing it safe is not to have any policies. I think playing it safe is to actually say, this is what you can expect from us and be believable so that then people can make an informed decision. At the moment, Turnbull's oscillating between positions so fast, the world's going to tilt on its axis soon. That's not attractive to the voters. Jason, what is attractive to the voters? <laughs> um, look, microeconomic reform, I think, would be attractive to them. I love it. The, the one thing I hear <laughs> the father every time <laughs> is microeconomic reform. They can't stop talking about it yeah. every time over a pint. Well, microeconomic reform creates jobs, and that's jobs are important. And that's, right. I think these these issues that, you know, with the drivers and the, um, the you know, attack on the Building Commission um, group, I mean, these... These are signal issues of this things that have gotten out of control, and a, um, an attempt to try and get these things straight opens up the door to further um, reform. So I, I'm I'm quite positive about the the, the the targeting of these. Moving over to well another news story, and I was going to say news story, but actually it's kind of an entertainment story at this point, and even that's a mix because it probably shouldn't be, but it is, and therein lies the, the problem. I'm talking, of course, about the 60 Minutes Lebanon saga. For just to recap for people who might not be caught up on that, four members of the 60 Minutes crew, including reporter Tara Brown, are currently sitting in a Lebanese prison. They're accompanied by five other men and Brisbane mum, Sally Faulkner, who were involved in an operation to recover Mrs. Faulkner's children on in Beirut last week. They could be facing up to 20 years in prison on kidnapping charges. There's a glimmer of hope, though, with the judge pressing Sally Faulkner and her estranged husband, Ali El Amin, to come to an agreement. So far, though, Ali has said he will not be dropping charges. 
before we get into this, uh, we should reiterate that ABC cannot confirm and is not reporting a direct link between the alleged payment by 60 Minutes to Sally Faulkner and Ms. Faulkner's payments to child recovery experts. Santa, is this not readings? I think so. Um, is that what causes this? Is the producer going this I don't, I don't know. Look, I was the public broadcaster, so I can't, I can't say. But look, when I first, when I first read about it, I actually thought it was like a joke. Like I, I, I didn't think that it was an onion story, if you will. Pretty much, because I just thought, how is it possible that um, journalists can put themselves in that kind of a situation? And particularly because it is rather complicated. I mean, you know, you're dealing with. Um, different governments and you're also dealing with you know essentially a, a, an issue that you know you want courts to deal with particularly when you're dealing with child custody and what seems you know to be you know 60 minutes siding particularly with the mother makes it seem as though it's a very one-sided um story and then also what they ended up doing in lebanon and you'd kind of wonder if they you know if the lebanese film crew came here and they did that you know what would we think i i just i i thought it was quite irresponsible um very unethical and yeah just not right. Jean, there is that aspect, and like I just said, the Western privilege aspect. Right? If, if a Lebanese film crew did come here and do that, they would not. They would be fairly harsh charges. The entire country would lose its mind. If right. a Lebanese film crew and Leb ex Lebanese soldiers came here and kidnapped chil like children off the street, like we like, is essentially what happened in Lebanon. They went and kid kidnapped children off the street. We would lose our minds, and I don't think anyone here can have any blame on the mother. If that was my children, I would do a deal with any devil to get them back, right. and I wouldn't care what laws were broken. So I can absolutely understand her point of view. But I, I mean, I think I agree with almost everyone on this, that but it is what about obscene. The father, like it's making this assumption that the father also doesn't have... Oh, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm just of, saying yeah, as a personal as a parent, emotional reaction. Yeah. As yeah. a parent, I can quite understand his point of view too, mm. that as a parent, you don't want to lose your children. Nobody does. And so I can see both sides of that. But for journalists to get involved for rating and entertainment, I think is obscene. And that it ended as badly as it did is tragic for both the parents and the children. But I actually have trouble feeling any sympathy for the journalists. Jason, how damaged is the is 60 minutes credibility going to be now at this point? Or do you think it'll make a difference? Do you think the next week the ratings will be up and it'll be fine? Look, I, 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 hope it's, I hope it is damaged by this because that, that feels like the, the morally correct outcome. But I fear it's not going to happen. I fear they've actually got the rate. I mean, the fact that we're talking about it right here. Are we just yeah. going to now see new schemes and, uh, from other TV channels and breaking this into developing nations and kidnapping people and being involved just to kind of get ratings more going? Is this the next thing, reality TV? Well, then what happens with that? Because then so somebody's going to ramp it up to the next step. So then what happens when somebody comes back, as I said, and and it's perceived as Middle Eastern men coming in and kidna kidnapping children from our streets? You know, we'd be at war. Well, there's a whole aspect of this which is very peculiar. It's, it was the news for me, for example, which is a child recovery team thing. That's a burgeoning it's not industry. child recovery, it's kidnapping. Right, but it's a burgeoning so industry it's now. It's thing you can buy. And, and they apparently bought the wrong one, was the story for a while. Which <laughs> well, it's not such a problem. The problem. Thing. There is actually no way of dealing with this legally. That if, you are, if your children are in Lebanon, and the, particularly the father's there, there is no legal recourse to get, to get them back or to get visitation rights or anything. You have absolutely we now access to any form of legal recourse. Well, even there, there was a discussion we, we were all having earlier, um, which is what was the plan? You grab these children and then where do you go? It's not like you can just get on a plane right away. There still are those issues. There is this whole aspect, I think, which at least makes it seem like they hadn't thought out things very far. Maybe they were trying to stage a reunion, you know, just have the mother <laughs> and the children and, you know, for the first time in how many years you haven't seen the children. Get that um, camera shot. That's okay, right. And then maybe do a follow up and kind of go, now we're really pushing for these children to come back. I don't know. Like, I'm just. But I just, I, I think that the person that cleared the story, um, you know, should bear the brunt of the responsibility because um, it's a shame because you've, you've got a crew that are now stuck in, 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 in Lebanon um, that perhaps um, weren't the ones necessarily responsible in the decision making and were just probably told, you know, you're going on this job. And um, yeah, so. But there is, well, look, realistically speaking, there is that thing, even now when you talk to people, no one believes that there will be a, a an actual prosecution, that eventually a diplomatic solution will happen or some kind of arrangement will be made. Um, there is that be belief on the street. When Why you talk do we people. assume that? Because, again, if the situations were reversed, if Lebanese men were here kidnapping children, we would never assume that they would just be handed back. We would There would be a demand that they'd be prosecuted, and I don't understand why... And well, I do understand why in the reverse that's not the case, but and I think that's based on racism. But I think 
Yep, she's right. It's based in racism. Back shortly with a new movie.